Well, welcome everyone to this virtual session on the metabolic management of kidney stones. I know it's not the most electrifying topic um, out there, but um, I hope to be able to engage with you all when we have our Q&A session. So um, I have no disclosures, um, and today we're gonna be examining the urologist's role in the metabolic workup and treatment of the kidney stone patient. Not the nephrologist's role, not the dietitian's role, but our role. And we're gonna review the AUA guidelines concerning medical management of kidney stones. Hopefully by the end, you'll develop some confidence in interpreting 24-hour urines or build on the confidence that you already have and be able to discuss various medical strategies and, and dietary strategies for managing these patients. So I'd like to start off with a case. Um, JB was referred to me for irritative urinary symptoms and hematuria, but with a negative culture. This was his CT urogram, which you'll note as I flip back and forth is bi excuse me, bilateral duplicated upper urinary tract symptom systems. And then here on the left, it's partially duplicated, coming to a single ureter around the iliac. And on the right, you can see that it's joining distally into a single ureter. But here in the bladder level, there is a thin walled structure that is filled with, I don't show you the non-contrast images, but a radio-opaque stone. So actually this is a ureter seal that is stone filled. And what that looked like endoscopically was this. Um, you can see uh, cystoscopically the stone crowning there. And what you have here is a 200 micron laser fiber on high energy, low frequency settings, and we are laterally incising this ureter seal at the base to, un, to um, expel the stone from the ureter seal and keep the ureter seal open. We're gonna use the beak of the cystoscope to sort of roll the stone out from the ureter seal and into the bladder, fairly massive stone, about three centimeters. Um, and what you'll see is there's a big ureter seal cavity and the cystoscope can even be introduced into the ureter. So clearly this is an anatomic issue. And so this person has a reason to make stones, right? I mean, we figured that out, we treated it, we should be done, right? Not exactly. The 24 hour urine study demonstrates that there are several abnormalities. There are, there's low urine volume, there's severe hypercalciuria, and there is high uric acid levels in the urine, and you'll note that the urinary pH is low as well. On top of that, there are several dietary factors that are abnormal. So even in the patient who you feel like may have an anatomic explanation, there can also be metabolic issues at foot. So nephrolithiasis is both a medical and a surgical disease, and by no means is surgery the endpoint of this disease. It affects one in 11 in the US at some point, that incidence has been steadily increasing over the last two decades. And the cost is a staggering $5 billion, including indirect cost a year. The, uh, these patients have a chronic disease process. They have metabolic stone disease and the recurrence risk is over 50% of 10 years. So these are patients who have other metabolic problems. We know our patients, they have hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. And so we have to follow and care for the whole patient and not just their surgical issue, um, their acute issue. Well, what do we do? So this was a survey of endourologists and general urologists. And what was found was that, surprisingly to me, over 80% of both groups perform their own medical management, which you know was surprising to me in my own anecdotal experience. Um, both groups felt that they actually provided pretty effective dietary recommendations, over 70%. Um, this is a good study sent to the Ender Urology Society. This was um, from Stephen Cotta and Christina Pence in Wisconsin. And they found that of Ender Urologists, almost 90% of them provided, personally provided their own recommendations. In other words, the doc did the dietary counsel. But in the small percentage of those who didn't, they did employ people such as dietitians or nutritionists or even nurses. And when asked why, time. Time was felt to be a factor. The most common answer was that this took about five to 10 minutes to do, but it could take a lot longer. Now you can bill for that time, but overall the physicians felt that they had insufficient time. And if they had their druthers, they would have 
another staff member do it um, besides themselves. We're going to go over the AUA guideline on the medical management of kidney stones, which was reapproved in 2019, first initiated in 2014. And there are 27 guideline statements, so sort of a long road we'll walk. And it's broken into four different categories that we'll march through. What's interesting is that the vast majority of them are either expert opinion or clinical principle, showing you the relative paucity of high level evidence in this space. So tackling the evaluation first, it, the guidelines state that a screening evaluation should be performed on all newly diagnosed kidney stone patients. Now, what's a screening evaluation? We'll review that uh, in, in a minute. A metabolic evaluation should be done in high-risk patients or interested first-time stone formers. What's a high-risk patient? This is a patient who has stones in the past, family history, do they have a medical disease that makes them more predisposed, like say renal tubular acidosis, gout, bowel disease, any of these things would be high risk. What's an interested first time stone former? It's that patient who says, this was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Please tell me what I could do to reduce my risk in the future. I will do anything, doc. Um, obtain a parathyroid hormone if the patient has hypercalcemia or if you suspect hyperparathyroidism. Of course, if there's a stone available, please analyze it. Review the imaging looking for patterns of broader disease processes, such as, say, renal tubular acidosis or medullary sponge. And it's recommended that you do not perform a fast or calcium load test because this doesn't change practice. Whether or not it's resorptive or absorptive, generally the treatment's the same. So thank you to the AUA in the core curriculum. I got uh, the next two slides from them. This is a screening evaluation. Essentially what it is, is a detailed history, which would be defined as family history, dietary history, and a medical history. It would be chemistries along with a calcium and a uric acid. And it would be a urine, UA and urine culture, looking for urease splitters. Um, of course, the stone analysis and, and, and images as well. The metabolic evaluation adds to that the 24-hour urine study um, and, and all the elements listed there. So speaking of 24-hour urines, do you do one or do you do two? This is sort of an existential question to, for endourologists. Um, some data, the, the Bagley group at Jefferson back in 2013 looked at this and they found that between the paired analyses of 236 patients, that only urinary volume and phosphorus were statistically different between the two days, but many parameters flipped from normal to abnormal. Um, so they may not have been large differences, but it might have pushed into the abnormal range. Marshall Stoller's group in 2010 found that there wasn't a difference. Um, so also two major metabolic figures in stone management, one at the University of Chicago and one at UT Southwestern, um, respectively Frederick Coe and Charles Pack, um, both different opinion as well. So I think that uh, what, I, what I do, I perform two on the, first on the first time I collect someone. And then after that, if it's pretty consistent, then I'll just do one from there out. But if you talk to different endurologists, they'll give you their answer as well. Moving into the dietary therapy, it is recommended that patients drink enough to achieve 2.5 liters of urine a day. That's the guideline statement, but that's not what patients are going to ask you. Patients are going to ask you, how much should I drink, doc? And you really can't answer that question because every person's different. Their body sizes are different. Their activity levels are different. So you can recommend that they take in enough to get to 2.5 liters a day. If you have a 24-hour urine and you know their volume and they know how much they drank, you may be able to extrapolate that, but it may be 80 ounces, maybe 120 ounces, um, but, it, but the marker that they need to hit is 2.5 liters. They need to limit their sodium. 2.3 grams is what's in the guidelines. Of course, the patient will say, but doc, I don't add salt to anything but it's not the salt that they're adding, or it could be, of course, but um, often it's the salt that's in the food and they need to become label readers. They need to consume a normal amount of calcium a day as defined as 
1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. Calcium oxalate stone formers with high oxalate levels in the urine, those should be the ones that get oxalate restriction and normalization of their calcium intake, okay? We'll come back to that. Calcium stone formers with low citrate should eat fruits and vegetables and limit their animal protein. So um, see the difference there in terms of who's restricting their oxalate and who's actually eating fruits and vegetables. We'll come back to this idea. Both calcium oxalate and uric acid stone formers that have high uric acid should decrease their animal protein and cysteine patients should decrease their animal protein and decrease their sodium. So let's march through some of these. So increased fluids, there is a randomized controlled trial that looked at two different groups. One was given the recommendation of high fluid intake and the other one was a control group. The difference in five years of stone recurrence was 12% in the high fluid group versus 27% in the control group. So clearly pushing the fluids makes a difference. But what fluids they take in make a difference too. This study looked at what type of beverages patients were taking, uh, taking in. Alcohol, um, wine, coffee, and tea were associated with lower risk, whereas sodas and sweetened beverages were associated with higher risk. I had this asterisk on the tea because really green tea should be what we're pushing. You'll see tea on the oxalate handout in terms of having high levels, but it's mostly darker tea, not so much green tea. In terms of the sodas, sometimes you'll have the patient that say, I drink so much cola, I know that's the problem, doc. I'm just gonna cut out my sodas, I'll be okay. Well, it's a factor. This randomized controlled trial found 6% decreased risk, absolute. So it's real, but um, it's not the home run. So there's probably something else going on with that patient. What about calcium? Well, we know that reducing sodium in the diet will reduce urinary calcium excretion almost linearly. We also know that a low calcium diet without any other dietary changes results in an increased risk of stone formation. And we know that from this landmark study from the New England Journal of Medicine, which established the Borgie diet. So these were two groups of patients. One was given the Borgie diet, which was normalization of dietary calcium, along with low sodium and low animal protein, versus what at the time was the traditional low calcium recommendation. And they found that although both groups decreased their urinary calcium levels, the the one who was told to limit their calcium actually had higher oxalate levels and double the stone recurrences. So this sort of established the Borgie diet as the way to go in the future. So um, low sodium, low animal protein, normal calcium, and high fluid. What about oxalate? Well, overly restrictive oxalate, low oxalate diet should be avoided because a lot of oxalate-containing foods have many health benefits. I think the perfect example is the DASH diet, which reduces hypertension and other CV risks. And this diet is loaded with oxalate. You have legumes and nuts and vegetables, and yet patients who take a lot of these foods actually have reduced risk of stones. And that probably has to do with limiting the animal protein and increasing the citrate in the diet. But the point is that really oxalate restriction should be reserved for calcium oxalate stone formers that have high oxalate levels. And really, when you've eliminated other ways to, to other measures, such as are they eating a normal calcium uh, diet? Are they taking vitamin C? So these are other things that you can do before taking away all their healthy foods. So uh, probiotics can help reduce uh, oxalate levels um, in some studies. Some studies find that's not true, but it's possible. Um, vitamin B6, also mixed data there. Manoj Manga found in 2011 that there was a reduction in oxalate excretion um, in patients who were on vitamin B6 versus not, but yet uh, other population-based data has not borne that to fruition. So, but it could be a factor. So these are other things you can do for oxalate. 
But if you have the patient that has a very high oxalate excretion, talking over 80, 90, 100, you need to start thinking of other disease processes, such as uh, bowel disease, malabsorption, um, or even genetic processes like primary hydroxyurea. Well, this is you at this point. <laughs> um, it's, uh, but you can imagine if you're a patient, um, the information overload that can happen in a session, uh, a dietary counseling session. This was a great study out of Wisconsin where uh, Dr. Penniston, um, who's their PhD dietitian there, um, surveyed patients after she counseled them about 30 days later. And she gave on average three recommendations per patient. And what she found was 47% of patients remembered all the recommendations if there were three or less given to them. If there were more than three given to them, only 23% of them remembered all. I mean, that's, that's a very small number. What this means to me is we really need to have high impact recommendations that are easy to understand and we need to have action items. So I give patients no more than two or three with each collection. I want you to work on X and Y between now and six months when we do this again. And slowly over time, you'll hit all these. This is a chronic disease process, so you'll have time. Moving to the pharmacologic therapy, it's recommended that thiazides are given for high or relatively high urinary calcium for patients who are recurrent calcium stone form. Potassium citrate should be given if the citrate is low in calcium stone formers. Note the verbiage of recurrent in both of these things. In other words, maybe give some dietary measures a try before you go to the meds. Allopurinol should only be given if the uric acid levels are high in calcium stone formers as well as uric acid stone formers. Remember, first line for uric acid stone formers is alkalinization it's potassium citrate. But if they have high uric acid levels that are not responding to diet, then yes, you can give allopurinol. And what I thought was very interesting in these guidelines was the suggestion that potassium citrate and thiazide can be given to recurrent stone formers, even in the absence of 24 hour parameters based on some randomized control data that suggests the decreased risk, even in those patients in the absence of 24 hour abnormalities. Word about thiazides, I see a lot of hydrochlorothiazide, and that's fine, but I also often see it misdosed for stones. I see it at the hypertension dose, probably because that's what we're familiar with, but it doesn't have a potent hyper, um, calciuric effect at that point. Chlorothaladone will at that 25 milligram a day dose, so I, I like that. Remember to watch the hypokalemia and the hyperglycemia in these patients. A word about cysteine. Drink a lot of fluid, limit the sodium, limit the animal protein. Both of those things will limit the cysteine excretion and then attack with tiopronin and potassium citrate. Tiopronin to break the sulfide bonds um, and uh, potassium citrate to change the chemistry of the solubility. In terms of follow-up, remember to obtain a 24-hour urine follow-up within six months of treatment and then moving forward as needed. Uh, blood work on patients who are on medication. If you have a patient who continues to make stones on your treatment, send a new analysis to make sure that the stone has not changed chemistries. Cal classic would be the uric acid stone former who is over alkalinized and is now a calcium phosphate stone former and you don't know it. Monitor the patients for uh, reinfection if they've had struvite and then obviously obtain follow-up imaging um, you know, periodically. I understand this is where we all are, but I'll finish briefly with a patient case. Uh, this is a complex patient who was on anticoagulation who's referred for a large renal pelvic stone and a history of a gastric bypass. And what you see on the imaging is this is a, actually a horseshoe kidney. You see the large pelvic stone, and then you see the isthmus, the thin isthmus crossing the midline here. And so, this is the large stone. So we go ahead and attain our retrograde access. Um, we then attain percutaneous access through the upper pole of a horseshoe kidney, right? Um, and uh, we insert our balloon and we manage the stone. The stone is calcium oxalate. We do some blood work. We find that the calcium level is high. So that leads to a parathyroid hormone, which is high. 
So we refer to our ENT surgeon and, and find that actually this is a sesame positive adenoma and it's removed and the parathyroid hormone is corrected. So we feel good about ourselves, but we aren't done because this patient's a gastric bypass patient and there are multiple metabolic abnormalities. There's some malabsorption, so there's hyperoxyuria. There is low urine pH and, and hypocitraturia. There are multiple dietary abnormalities uh, with this particular patient. So this patient really brings it all together. We need multiple dietary manipulations in this patient. Um, they need to normalize their calcium and decrease their oxalate. They need to limit their animal protein and sodium. We need to start potassium citrate for this low citrate level and monitor the therapy. And then of course, we need to follow this patient and make sure things are improving because it turned out this patient ultimately needed allopurinol. So in conclusion, stones are both a surgical and medical disease and follow-up is essential and we can reduce the risk of stones with metabolic management. And it may require both diet and medication, but the, the manipulations are fairly straightforward and in the complex patient, please employ your uh, experts in the field if necessary. I really appreciate everyone's time. Sorry for going about a minute over and uh, I look forward to meeting you all in the Q&A session. Thanks so much.